May I ask what you're hanging around for? Selling kisses. I was never more humiliated in my life. To think that you, you of all people... Oh, dry up. And get your big feet off our furniture. I should think you'd be ashamed. Right under the picture of your brother who's out fighting for his country while you're dragging the name of Archer through the mud. You leave Lenny out of this. Well, when he comes home on leave, you'll find out. Lenny must know. It's absolutely imperative that he doesn't know. You mean imperative. I mean you're to shut up. I shall make a point of telling him personally. And take that bobby pin out of your mouth. Dexter Franklin, you're about as low and vile a person as ever I laid eyes on. I'll thank you to just get up and go home and stay home, and I'll thank you never to show your silly face here again. You get that from Mildred, too. She's got a temper like a fishwife. Dexter, dear, don't say things like that. It hurts me. I just can't bear it when my friends don't like each other. Well, I got nothing against Mildred personally. But she puts ideas into your head and... Dexter, dear, would you like to do me a terrific favor? I'd do anything for you. You know I would. Do you mean that, Dexter? Holy cow. Happened to always. When you put that dead fish in my mother's lingerie drawer, who took the blame? Oh, that was when we were just kids. Well, don't you believe I'd do more for you now? The way I feel about you now. Well, how can I be sure? Well, just ask me. There's nothing I wouldn't do for you. Then, will you promise not to tell Lenny when he does come home? On account of Mildred and Lenny and romance is so beautiful. We know that, don't we, Dexter? And we wouldn't want to spoil Lenny's leave, would we? So just promise you won't say anything more about it. Please, Dexter? Okay, I promise. Oh, I knew I could rely on your southern chivalry. Yeah, but on one condition. What's that? Well, it's nothing you gotta do right now. Immediately. It's just, well, just what we've been talking about. You know what I mean. Well... Is there any harm in telling me? Don't make me go through it all again, Corliss. You know what I mean. After all, I will be 18 someday. And even 19 and 20. Are you proposing to me, Dexter? Don't kid about it, Corliss. I know it sounds funny when all I got's an allowance of 50 cents a week. But it isn't funny to me. I'm only asking you to wait for me. All right, Dexter. I'll wait. Gosh, Corliss, you're swell. <clears throat> Do you want Mom to catch a snacking? Gosh, no. Don't forget, we're going to the movies tonight. Okay. <laughs> that was then and this is now. Hi, I'm Jerome Cortland. I want to thank you for inviting me to share this evening with you. I'm a fourth-generation Knoxvillian. My great-grandfather settled in Knoxville in 1835. My grandfather was born in Knoxville in 1847, was educated in Knoxville. His education was interrupted by the Civil War. At the close of the Civil War, he continued his education at a school called East Tennessee University, which we now know as University of Tennessee. My dad and his brothers and sisters were all born in Knoxville. They graduated from Knoxville High School and graduated from the University of Tennessee. And uh, then I came along. I, uh, I was born here, raised here, and when I was in the 10th grade, I also went to Knoxville High School. <laughs> there's, there's a funny story I can remember in the 10th grade. When, uh, when I went to my English class that, that first day, and I introduced myself to the teacher. She said, oh, Cortland, you're Oldman, Jr. I remember your dad very well. And, oh, he was such a wonderful boy and a great student. And, oh, I'm sure you're going to follow in his footsteps. Well, <laughs> dad's a great guy, <laughs> I have to admit. Uh, but uh, he was not a great student. He seemed to find some kind of mischief to get into. Uh, well... Maybe she was right in one respect. I guess I did follow in his footsteps. You may wonder why, since I was christened Cortland Jeroleman Jr., my name kind of got twisted around and I became Jerome Cortland. That's a crazy story. <laughs> um, 
When I was about six, mother and dad got a divorce. Mother moved to New York where she became a singer on that hot new medium radio. And dad stayed in Knoxville. So during the school year, I'd spend that with dad. And then summer vacations, I'd spend with mother. When I was about, I think about nine, she moved from, from New York to California. And let's see, the summer I was 17, I went to visit her there. And second night there, she took me to a party. There were a lot of celebrities at the party, people she'd known from her radio days in New York. And she took me around, introduced me to some people. And then later in the evening, she came over and she said, you see that man standing over there? And I looked. She said, that's Charles Vidor. Name didn't mean anything to me. She said, he's a very famous film director and he's been prepped for a film called Together Again with Irene Dunn and Charles Boyer. And they were big stars at the time. And she said, he told me that he has been looking all over town for the juvenile lead in the film and it should be a 17-year-old boy. And she said, he'd like to give you a screen test. And I, I thought, well, that's kind of crazy. He's cocktail parties probably drunk. But uh, anyway, we went over and I said hi to him. I was introduced. Mother said, uh, Charles, I'd like you to meet my son, Cortland Jerolman Jr. And we chatted a bit. He had a, a very heavy Hungarian accent. And uh, he asked me a few questions about myself. And then as, as we were leaving, he said, now, uh, first thing Monday morning, I want you to call my office make a, a, an appointment with my secretary. And, and I said, okay, because really just to placate him. And uh, I'd really forgotten all about it by the first thing Monday morning. First thing Monday morning, I was in the kitchen eating a bowl of cereal and the phone rang. And mother answered it and listened for a couple of seconds and then she handed me the phone. And it was the secretary, it was Charles Vidor's secretary. She wanted to know if I was coming down to the studio. So I said, does he really want me to come down to the studio? And she said, oh yeah, but you'd like to be here at two o'clock if you can. And I said, okay. Now, I started out the house uh, and mother said, wait just a minute, you know, when his secretary called, she asked for Jerome Cortland. Charles is Hungarian, he probably got your name all twisted around. I said, okay. And she said, now, if he calls you Jerome Cortland, answer. <laughs> I said, mother, I'm not stupid. I'll answer. So I went down to the studio. Mr. Uh, Vidor was really, very nice. He took me in to see the writer, producer, lady by the name of Virginia Van Up. And uh, I interviewed with the two of them for a while. They asked me a lot of questions about myself, but <laughs> They were intrigued by my East Tennessee accent. They wanted to give me a screen test. And they handed me the script and told me what scenes to, to, uh, to rehearse. And as I was walking out of the door, Mr. Vidor said, you know, I, I, have your, um, I have your mother's phone number at home in my book, but I don't have it here at the office. What's the number? So I gave him the number, he wrote it down. And uh, then he started writing my name, J-E-R, is it one R or two, he said. I said, I don't know, one, I guess. And he gave me kind of a funny look and then said, oh, is there an E on the end of it? And I said, sure, put an E on the end of it. So <laughs> anyway, by the time I got home, I was laughing so hard at my own, <laughs> my own inept ineptitude. And Mother said, uh, well, how'd the interview go? And I said, Mother, if it's a part for a stupid guy, I got it. <laughs> and I got it. And then I worked for, uh, well, Columbia put me under contract for seven years, and I worked um, in a lot of films as an actor. About 20 years, I did some, I don't know, 25, 30 films. And I did a lot of TV. I worked on Broadway. I worked in theaters and nightclubs as a, as a vocalist. And I finally decided that might be more interesting on the other side of the camera, behind the camera instead of in front of it. So uh, I was able to get a position 
at Disney as an associate producer first, and then I became a producer. I produced films like Pete's Dragon, Escape to Which Mountain, Return from Which Mountain, a bunch of stuff, and then directed some films and television at Disney also. I sang the title song over Disney's film Old Yeller. Old Yeller, Old Yeller, Old Yeller. And uh, I recorded on the Disney label. Then I decided I wanted to try freelance directing. I directed shows like Dynasty, Falcon Crest, Knott's Landing, Fantasy Island, Love Boat, <laughs> Flying Nun. Now I'm retired and my wife and I are living in California and are having a great time with our children and our grandchildren. Anyway, thanks one more time for inviting me tonight. I hope I haven't been too long-winded for you. Good night.